Whether he's wanted to or not, and I suspect sometimes he's probably wanted to, Hanif Qureshi has uh, courted a controversy from his uh, Oscar-nominated My Beautiful Laundrette. Uh, pipped to that golden statue by Woody Allen's Hannah and her sisters. Uh, it was also nominated for a BAFTA in 1987. Um, that, from that moment, he firmly established himself as, as an original voice. And for those of you who haven't seen it, why haven't you seen it? Um, it features gay sex between a white boy and a Pakistani boy, drug dealers posing as mullahs, dodgy Pakistani businessmen. Um, it was a distinctive voice. Um, the voice that wrote this, this screenplay and uh, presented a very different immigrant narrative at the height of Margaret Thatcher's Britain. He exploded cultural stereotypes and seemed to be, uh, that seemed to be a kind of guiding principle for him. In 1990, he wrote his first novel, The Buddha of Suburbia, and that was about a mixed-race teenager who is desperate to escape his suburban life in South London. Again, plenty of sex in this book, lots of very fruity language. Um, he's a writer that I grew up with, and because of that, I was particularly delighted to be asked to, to, to interview um, him. He, he wrote stories that I wanted to read. And I could go on to list everything else that he's written. I'm not going to, because you can find that out for yourself. I just wanted to mention those two things that were the, thing, the two bits of writing that completely established his, his reputation at a very, very young age. He's now written his seventh novel, The Last Word, and there are lots of them in that room next door. I urge you, if you haven't read it, to, to buy one immediately after this conversation. And before I start asking him any questions at all, I'm hoping that he is going to read from it. It's essentially about, well, it's about lots of things, but it's essentially about the construction of a literary biography. Uh, Harry Johnson is 30, young, good-looking, and he's hired to write a biography about a writer called Mamoon Azam. He's a literary titan in his 70s from the Indian subcontinent. And for those of you who are alert enough to know about these things, will recognise that many, many people have already said that this is redolent of Patrick French writing a biography of V.S. Naipaul. Hanif may disagree or agree. We'll talk about that later. Hanif, would you please read from your, from your book? Thank you, Rosie. Um, this is a bit from the beginning. Harry knew that not a moment of the day passed when someone wasn't telling a story. And if his luck held for the rest of the day, Harry was about to be employed to tell a story about the man he was going to meet. Indeed, he'd been chosen to tell the whole story of this important man, the significant artist. But how, he wondered, with a rush of, rush of terror, did you begin to do that? And more importantly, was he capable of, of it? Harry gazed out of the train window at the genteel English countryside and almost wept. If the newspapers were right, Britain was a crowded island teeming with busy immigrants. Many were clinging to the sides as on a little boat about to capsize. Meanwhile, everyone on board was so close together they were beginning to turn on one another like trapped animals particularly since the financial crash. With the coming scarcity, no jobs, pensions, security, things would only deteriorate, and the safety that Harry had grown up with was gone. Not only that, it was said there were thousands of asylum seekers and refugees at the border desperate to get into Britain. Some were packed in lorries, others hung from the undercarriages of trains. Many were tiptoeing across the channel on tightropes slung across the sea while others were fired from cannons based in Boulogne. Children were strapped to the bodies of pigeons and sent across to Canterbury. Ghosts had it easy. But to Harry now, it seemed as if the govern government was injecting a strong shot of anxiety into the body politic, because all he could see was a green and unpleasant England. Neat fields, trimmed trees, bubbling streams, and the kind sky above it all. It didn't look as though you could get a curry for miles. Harry heard a whoosh, and beer spat at his face. He turned his head. Rob Devereux, sitting opposite Harry and cracking open another tin, was an editor at a respected and innovative publishing house. Not long ago, he'd approached Harry with the idea of commissioning him to write a biography of the distinguished immigrant writer, the Indian-born Mamoon Azam. A novelist and essayist, Harry had admired since he was a teenage book fiend. Harry was immediately responsive and excited. 
After years of study and obedience, things were turning good for him, as his teachers had said they would. If he concentrated his thoughts, zipped his fly and his lip. This was his break, and he wanted to weep, weep with relief. He deserved it, he reckoned. Not long before, in his late twenties, Harry had published a well-received biography of Nehru, containing much new material. And although the familiar story had now, in the modern manner, to be lightly spiced with interracial copulation, buggery, alcoholism, anorexia, the work was considered on the whole to be subtle and illuminating. <laughs> Even Indians liked it. <laughs> now Harry was reviewing and teaching. Today, on a sunny Sunday afternoon, Harry and Rob were on the train to Taunton to visit Mamoon at the house where the legendary writer had lived for most of his adult life. He shared it now with his new wife, Liana, a spirited Italian woman in her early 50s. Rob had no doubt that Mamoon would help Harry since... Mamoon had finally agreed, agreed that the book was a good, if not essential, idea. Liana was proving to be extravagant, if not more expensive and indeed more explosive than any woman Mamoon had experienced before. Rob said it was as if Gandhi had married Shirley Bassey and they'd gone to live in Ambridge. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. If the book was a success, he would be set up for years. It would be his ticket to ride. But, said Rob, let's not get carried away. It'll be a fire walk. The old man will exasperate you with his stubbornness and taunting. His wife will de definitely make you completely demented. And you might have to sleep with her. What? Why? It'll be worth it to get the, get the story, said Rob. And you're a pig with a keen snout when it comes, out, comes to sniffing out the truffle of a woman. Let it be her. There's been so much written already about... A the extent to which this book mirrors the story of Patrick French writing about V.S. Naipaul. This is right at the beginning of the interview, so let's just get it out of the way. Tell us whether you were thinking about that, because there are so many. I mean, Mamoon is very much like Sir Vidya. My stuff's always got grumpy Indian old men in it. If you look at my beautiful laundra or the Buddha Suburbia, any of my stuff, it's my, you know, grumpy Indian old men or my Mona Lisa. Um, <laughs> You know, I come from a big Muslim family with a lot of... My dad had ten brothers. So I'm used to all those boys and all that smoking and drinking and showing off and shouting and fighting. So a character like Mamoon and the men in the Buddha or whatever are very familiar to me. So it wasn't as though I suddenly woke up one day and said I should write a, you know, a story or a picture of a particular writer. It was just... That the characters in my stories have got older and older. That's <laughs> all. When they finally ended up in their 80s. It, it, it's interesting hearing you say that, that you wanted to write about, um, you know, an, an, an older writer or a writer and then a younger man because you used to be a young man because you could argue that this novel is about different parts of your literary self um, just as much as it might be about anything else that somebody might want to impose on it. Did, did you, when you'd finished writing it, think... Yes, this is as much about what I think about the, the journey of a writer, what it means to write, the importance of writing, why that should have a place in, in our society. Because so many of the conversations yeah. between Harry and Mamoon are about the importance of, of words. Well, why bother about books at all? Why have stories? And not only that, because the, the, the fact of our against Rushdie in 89 had a big impact on me. Um, I was writing away, and then one day there was the fatwa, and after that you had to think, well, why am I doing this? Why does it matter that we're writing novels? What should we be writing novels about? And what is it to write a novel, let's say, I don't know, in China? What would it be like to write one in Pakistan? What's it like to write one in Britain, wherever? What is the meaning of these stories? What do they do for people? What are stories are meant for me? How have they changed my life? What's the point of all this scribbling away? As my kids say to me, all you do is sit in that room and scribble away, don't you? And you think, all I do is sit in this room and scribble away. And why are we doing this? So this book is an attempt to write a comedy about why we tell stories and what the point of the whole damn thing is and why it matters. And why it matters about the, how we use language and what language means and, and how we can communicate seriously to one another. In a time, as you know, as everybody knows, as you know, there's a lot of media, there's a lot of chatter going on in the whole world all the time, but actually, can you say anything 
that really matters to somebody else and that will affect them or hear something that will affect you. After the fatwa, and I spent some time in schools and colleges and at the mosques from which I was thrown out. Um, Why? Talking. What did you do? What did you say? I was making notes. It was so great. I was making notes and they said to me, they came over and they said, you're a friend of someone in Rishis, aren't you? And I said, yeah. They said, go on, piss off, get out of here. I said, listen, pal, this is God's house. It's not up to you. They picked me up and they threw me out of the mosque, the Whitechapel mosque. It's like being thrown out of a pub at closing time. <laughs> go on, piss off. Yeah. And this, this was research that you were doing for the Black Album, which what became... And, and, and my son, the fanatic. Yeah. I just wanted to, to speak to these kids because... I was so shocked by what was going on, and my father obviously had come to England, as it were, in order to have a better time, to have more freedom, to, to, to get away from the constraint of his family and his background. So the idea that you'd come to Britain and want more constraint was such a puzzle to me. It was so fascinating and so interesting about what was going on with those kids. Um, and I thought I would write about it. It seemed to me to be important. And that's what I'd always written about, really, what, what it was like to come, to come out of the empire, come to Britain and try and live here. I don't read novels for personal reasons, because it interferes with my signal. You know, what I want to do, I, I, I need to be in a certain state of mind, and if I read somebody else's book, if I, sometimes you read something and it's so good and you think, I'm, this is hopeless, <laughs> it's really pointless for me to go on, it's so beautiful, I can never write as well as this. And if you read anything bad, it's obviously a waste of time, so I can't, I can't get in the right place. But I read poetry. I don't need to read. I know what I'm doing now. I finally, have, I know what I'm doing, and I, can, I, I, and I can sort of work out how to do it. I did all that before. I know what I'm doing now, and I want to do it completely individually in my own way. I want to find out what a novel is, or a story is, or an essay is, as I write it. And I want it to be new as I do it. I want it to be as if no one's written a story before, or I've never written before. So I really want that sort of clarity, like having a conversation with somebody that is completely honest. Is that completely different in, in your mind as a process to the way it was when you first started writing, which felt, certainly for people who read you, that, that you were completely located in the politics of, of, of the time, the, the socio-economic situation of the time? Does it feel as though you're in a different... It's almost like you've transcended that, the, the kind of prosaic. Well, I wanted to, get, I wanted to be in the 60s. Because in the 60s, everybody was Jimi Hendrix, and it was a much more liberated place and time. And it was freer, and it wasn't so racist. As soon as I got to London, it stopped being racist for me. Because London was so cosmopolitan and mixed, and it was a different world. You know, and it, you were away from the National Front, and, you know, all... A lot of my friends were skinheads, you know, all of that stuff. So I got away from it. That's why I wanted to get away. But I wanted to write about it as a realist because so then you could see what was going on. I didn't want to write it symbolically like, say, someone like Kafka. I wanted it to be like he was wearing that and they listened to that and they did that and that so that people knew. It was a sort of record. And also I realised that I was very, very lucky because nobody had written from that position in England before. It was just luck. It was me. Bad luck for the public, but good for me. And I could, I had a subject, which was the way in which Britain was conducting a huge experiment in terms of race. And it had completely changed from a monocultural to a multicultural society that we now live in without anybody deciding this. And it was an incredible revolution that I lived through by mistake. Um, and I wanted to write about that, and I still want to write about it, and it still interests me.